Good morning. This is Bill from Adi Europa Naples on a sort of cloudy, stormy Friday. You know, there, there are hurricanes hitting other people uh, in other states, which is fine. Uh, you know, when you live down here in Florida, you kind of get this better them than us attitude. And when you see that thing take a turn and go somewhere else, it's cause for celebration. I'll also say this, a bunch of other states when it comes to storms are... Um, I don't know if I can use that word or not. I'll use something more G-rated. They're wimps, absolute wimps. I mean, we see a Category 2 heading this way, and we're like, oh, is it Tuesday already? Uh, you know, they get a bad tropical storm in Georgia or Virginia, and you'd think the world was ending. So, uh, you know, you do kind of get geared up for these things. But uh, anyway, down here, everything nice and proper. Uh, we've got some clouds in the air actually causing some cool winds to blow. And I have... I have this 1979 Pontiac Trans Am. Uh, this is a car that is very near and dear to my heart, mainly because essentially this was my first car. Uh, it was not a Trans Am, it was a Formula, which was sort of a stripper Trans Am, if you will. Uh, that doesn't mean it was dancing around on poles, it means it you know, didn't have all the same content as the Trans Am. Uh, but it basically the same car. It's the second generation F-Body. Uh, it uh, ran from 1970 and a half all the way through 1981. Uh, it went from 70 and a half because it had all kinds of production problems in the beginning. They couldn't get it out early. It came out in, uh, you know, in 70, which, uh, you know, new cars are supposed to come out the year before. Uh, anyway, let's just get into it. The history of Pontiac, very, very quickly. It starts with a guy named Eddie Murphy, but not that Eddie Murphy. And he made a company called the, um, uh, the Oakland uh, Manufacturing Co. way back in the uh, the 19th century, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, you know, did eh, a few cars. They weren't particularly successful, but in 1907 or 1908, General Motors bought him out, and that must have been a harrowing enough experience to give the poor bastard a stroke because he dropped dead. And uh, a few years later, you know, Pontiac emerged from the ashes of the Oakland Manufacturing Company all the way in 1926 or seven. And uh, anyway, so Pontiac has been around a long time and it was a shame that uh, GM made it uh, go the way of the dodo bird it really was I think Pontiac was a great division uh, to get into the history of the firebird we're gonna go uh, you know all the way back to 65 a guy you might have heard of uh, John Z DeLorean uh, he became the uh, the head of Pontiac the youngest head of any GM division when he became head of Pontiac uh, inherited from a guy who went on to man Chevy and DeLorean was a real car guy. He had been chief designer since uh, 1955 or so. He was essentially responsible for the GTO, a car that they snuck in under the GM brass. They didn't want it, but uh, DeLorean came up with it anyway and his buddy and uh, they put it out there and it sold so GM couldn't say crap. They had to go with it. Uh, and then the Mustang came out and that changed a bunch of things because you know GM thought the Mustang was a piece of crap, which it was, and that it wasn't going to sell well. But it did, and uh, so GM had to respond, and they came out with the Camaro. Pontiac wanted its own version of the Camaro, so they got the Firebird. But it basically, DeLorean was just handed a Camaro and said, you have to keep everything the same, basically. Uh, you know, do your tweaks, whatever, but your Camaro is this Firebird. Your Firebird is this Camaro. So he, you know, changed the front end. He used the uh, Pontiac motor in it. He did a few little bits and pieces to make it a more plush version of the Camaro. And it sold pretty damn well for what it was. Uh, Pontiac, you know, it established itself with under DeLorean's rule as the third most prolific car maker in the United States, which was a pretty envied position. Uh, so Ford, Chevy obviously sold the best. And then Pontiac came in third, which ain't too bad. Uh, anyway, in 70 and a half, they changed it to the second gen F body, uh, which I think is one of the most attractive Call it a sports car, call it what you want, in in, uh, in history. It was sort of molded, uh, molded after the 50s Ferraris, long, sleek front end, short, stubby rear end, nice declining C-pillar in the back, uh, and it became a very, very pretty car. And uh, you do have to give them some credit for the design. Uh, they, they actually sold quite a few Trans Ams, not the first year in 69. Those things are worth a fortune. But as time went on, they sold a bunch, and we'll get into why. Uh, 
Trans Am is actually a race series held by the SCCA. And when Pontiac decided to use that name, they had to pay the SCCA five bucks a car for every Trans Am they built. So the SCCA is not, a, you know, not unlike the mafia. They come up with all kinds of little ways to make money. Oh my God, I'm rambling on. Anyway, this, this is such a treat for me. I mean, you know, when I got my first uh, car, the Firebird, the Formula Firebird in 85, it was only six years old. But when I look back on that time, I, you know, it was like a Model T. It was so ancient. It's weird the way we look at things as uh, time rolls on. Uh, I mean, I couldn't conceive. I've never owned a car only six years old. I mean, every car I own is an old tired turd. And, uh, you know, the fact that my first one was only six years old is shocking to me. But Eh, of course I was young. Anyway, uh, the Trans Am developed a huge following with the hit movie Smokey and the Bandit in 1977 uh, with Burt Reynolds then in his prime uh, and uh, Sally Field who, you know, in retrospect now is less annoying than she was at the time. And man, people went nuts for them. All of a sudden, they're buying thousands and thousands of Trans Ams. And uh, the reason for that is just simple, pop culture. I mean, this was the height of the disco era. Macho was in, gold chains, open collars, silky shirts. And uh, the Trans Am fit dead in the middle of that perfectly. And uh, I think they sold more 79 Trans Ams than any other year. It was sort of the high point of the car. And, uh, you know, it, it just sort of declined after that. Anyway, let's get into this thing. Let's get into this thing. Uh, this thing is really, really special. It's got 27,000 miles. Uh, it is an incredibly original condition. Uh, yeah, but it's not a garage queen. It's not something that some guy specifically stored and kept nice. It's like a car that time forgot. It just, you know, somebody drove it. They didn't want to trade it. They put it in the garage. It sat for many, many years, you know, getting driven a little bit. And then some other guy bought it and he did basically the same thing. So when we got it in a few weeks ago, it just had this look of a car that would have been on a car lot in 1985. I mean, not particularly mint, but uh, in good shape and just a genuine time machine. Uh, here in the back, you can see uh, it's got the original bags for the T-tops, the original jack. Uh, the detailer, of course, didn't uh, put everything back the way uh, it was supposed to be in here, but he would have needed a, uh, you know, a, a graph for that or some sort oh, wait a minute. Okay, so he could have just looked at that and put it back accordingly, but he didn't. But anyway, it's all, we've had the original inflators in there, hilarious, uh, the original temp spare, very, very cool. Even the, uh, the little uh, trunk light is working, and because this was a Trans Am, it had options like um, uh, remote trunk release inside the glove box. You can also see those rather gorgeous blacked out taillights, beautiful. Uh, this thing, man, this always sagged down and was a real piece of crap on my car. I, I, one day I ordered the hinge from GM and it got better, but the fact that this original hinge is in that condition tells you what you need to know about this car. Back window in great shape. They love to rust here. This is original paint on this car, most of it anyway, and uh, there is uh, pretty much zero rust anywhere to be found. Actually, I don't need to uh, open the door to get under the hood, so... This is going to be hard. In fact, I've got to put the camera down for this. I'm going to put it down and aim it at the car while I do it. It is a front release. You pull here to pop it. Get your fingers creeped in here. Pull it again. And up it comes. Oh, God. All right. If I hadn't have done that 40,000 times in the 80s, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it today. Okay, here's what's neat about the Trans Am, the shaker hood scoop. That's this thing here in the middle. And you know, for you F-body guys out there who are looking at the engine of this thing, and you say, oh my God, it's dirty and nasty, but you know what that means. This thing is all original. I mean, nobody's ever screwed with it. Look at the blue valve covers. Look at the shaker hood. Even in the back of the shaker hood, nobody ever cut out that, uh, that weird little chromey trim it has. I mean, it is so rare to find one of these cars that doesn't have chrome valve covers and holly carburetors and all kinds of screwed up things. I mean, this is a true 27,000 mile original engine. 
Uh, now you see it says 6.6 .6 liter on the side. That's a bit of a shame. If it said TA 6.6, .6, that would mean that it had the um, uh, the big uh, Pontiac uh, 400 in it. 6.6 uh, .6 liter means that it has the 403 Oldsmobile engine, as my car did. And the reason for that is GM was this was a terrible era for GM. I mean, absolutely terrible. Heading into the 80s, where they had. Uh, uh, basically, they became sort of a laughing stock, and they just didn't know what they were doing. I mean, they were doing all this badge engineering. One car looked like another. They put a Chevy badge on a Cadillac or vice versa. Uh, they were figuring out that they needed to have corporate engines, which they didn't for many, many years. Uh, they were starting to throw all the specific engines into, like, this is an Oldsmobile engine. That never would have happened in 1970. Uh, it would have had a Pontiac engine. Uh, you know, later on, they went on to only have Chevrolet engines. So it just sort of, you know, was a weird time for GM. Uh, DeLorean was long gone. He went on to make some stupid movie people may have heard about where they had some car that was a time machine or something. Also got into cocaine. But uh, he was long gone, and GM was going through changes. But uh, anyway, so this one had the Oldsmobile 403, which also means that it had the Turbo Hydro 350 automatic and a very tall rear end gear, because in 1970, uh, cafe standards had taken effect and what those were was uh, fuel uh, economy regulations from the government uh, that every car had to get you know every every division every company had to average a certain amount of fuel mileage and uh, while the muscle car was already troubled from all the oil embargoes and you know 70s stuff that was going on the cafe standards really threw it for a loop and everything went weak so uh, this 403 I mean 403 cubic inches I mean, it should have a thousand horsepower. Instead, it has 185. So uh, that was just the way that uh, GM and the world was going at the time. Uh, but it's a bulletproof engine, puts out lots of torque. It was great for me. I won a lot of races with it. Uh, you can see this one is air conditioned. That great old long body GM compressor makes the air ice cold. And again, the originality of this car, all the way that it came, uh, is uh, pretty damn neat to see. Let's get that back down. I just love that shaker hood scoop. Okay, it wouldn't be a Trans Am video if we didn't talk about this thing, and that is the screaming chicken on the hood. Uh, you know, uh, that's said with both love and hate, the whole screaming chicken thing. It takes up the entire hood. Uh, it came out in, I want to say, 74, and uh, was definitely a unique feature of these cars that, uh, you know, has gone on to uh, some degree of fame. Uh, you see the Trans Am logo on the side, pretty cool stuff. Uh, this one has the WS6 alloys. Uh, you can tell the difference between the ones that have a lip on the outside and the ones that don't, 15 uh, by 7 versus 15 by 8. Uh, I don't believe this has the WS6 performance handling package, but it does have the rims with the red inserts. Uh, part of a uh, special order package. Uh, the decals on this car are all pretty neat and original. Uh, you see it as the original air extractor vents in the side of the fenders. That was an original feature of the car when it came out in 70 and a half. And uh, god damn, is it a good looking piece. Uh, it also has T-tops, which you absolutely have to love. You pull this little handle down here lift this up you can put them in the bag in the trunk and uh, drive around with the uh, uh, the top open wide uh, also if you see the way this door closes I mean that just again illustrates the life that this car has had this is not a worn out turd it's in incredible shape uh, the original interior back there not blown out from the Sun the package shelf all original uh, really really incredible stuff all right, let's hop in. First of all, the back seats. And I can tell you that some of you watching those videos don't laugh because I'm sure many of you were uh, conceived in the back seat of one of these things. Uh, that was basically what this car was for in the 1970s. Uh, you can see the original uh, velour material is incredibly well preserved, no fading in the carpet. Uh, the door panels and back panels look fantastic. You know, it is rare to find an original car in this condition. I thought the whole interior had been redone until I noticed this entryware right here. And I thought, wow! So, I mean, that is an original seat from 1979, which really just shows you the, uh, the soft life this car has had. Uh, you know, again, GM, not the best fit and finish in this vintage. Everything was cheap as hell. I mean, the little trim around the 
door locks. You know, if it had roll-up windows, it would have had a crank right here. So this one had power windows, so they just put a cap with a Firebird over it. You know, you get what you get. Uh, you could put a little 9mm in there, I guess, but it's the 70s. Everyone's into disco. Nobody's shooting anyone, so uh, probably not something you need to do. Uh, my steering wheel, all this was broken and nasty. In fact, I had a broken uh, stalk in the middle of it. I ended up putting some sort of a Grant GT wheel on it, but uh, uh, the original wheel is just so much prettier. I also love the, um, uh, the fish scale <coughs> in the... Uh, instrument cluster. That was borrowed from Bentley, if you will. You see radial tuned suspension there. If it was a WS6 car, it would say it there. Uh, being the Trans Am, it has a tack. Mine didn't. It has a clock where the, uh, uh, the whole thing was a clock in mine, just a little clock in the middle of this. Uh, you get your wiper controls here, your headlights. Uh, real quick, I'll show you the headlights because this is neat. This is one of the neat things about this car. Uh, this is one bumper laws were also coming into effect and so many cars so many american cars of this vintage had giant battering rams in the front that looked ridiculous uh, the trans am was one of the uh, or the firebird the first to use this sort of polyurethane front end that flowed into the car and looked terrific without having a big nasty stupid steel bumper on it so that was a pretty important feature Thank John Z for that one. Uh, also, we've got a tote wheel. Nice. I didn't have that on mine. It was always in the same position. And let's fire this thing up. It's carbureted. Give it a pump. Watch the shaker hood when I fire it. I mean, how cool is that? So when you uh, rev the thing over, that shaker is going to move in tandem with the revs on the turn on the AC, which this car does have good AC. And maybe move my seat forward a little bit. This thing's set up for Burt Reynolds. Okay, so here we are behind the wheel of the 79 Trans Am. You see the lovely little sporty steering wheel. Uh, in 79, Road and Track said this was absolutely the best uh, handling car in America at the time, which is shocking to me as a leaf spring rear end and uh, did have an independent front, but yeah, what the hell? I mean, it, Honda Accord handles better now, way better. Uh, you can see I've got the stupid brake light on. I told the guys to fix that. It's just a sticking, uh, the emergency brake is off, but the little indicator is stuck, so that's annoying. They should have fixed that. Uh, you got your oil pressure, you got your water temp in the middle, uh, you've got your fuel over here, your volt, so a full set of gauges. Uh, what the hell is this thing over here? I didn't have this on mine. Rear defrost, so you can turn that on. You got the original cigarette lighter. It's got to have been used. Yeah, it does. This is the 70s for God's sake, everyone was smoking their disco shirts. Now here is the uh, the absolute joy of my life. This thing, by virtue of the popularity of Smokey and the Bandit, came with the factory CB option. So for you snowflakes out there, this little cell phone that's got a cord attached to it, uh, you can use your handle, not your Twitter handle, you don't need an at sign, but your CB handle, Citizens Band Radio. And I got a handle because of, uh, I'm using air quotes here, my friends at the racetrack. Uh, my propensity to hit people, cars, and things. They call me pinball, so I figured, what the hell, that'll be my CB thing. Uh, so what you would do is you would, you would pull this up to your face, uh, you would press the button on the side, and you'd use uh, not things like LOL or ROFM or you know any version of those. Uh, you would you would use CB lingo. So uh, breaker one nine, breaker one nine, uh, the pinball here, got your ears on, radio check over, and somebody would essentially come back to you and confirm that they had their ears on. Uh, if you remember Smokey and the Bandit, it was one of the great exploitation films uh, of all time, back when movies could be politically incorrect. Uh, you had Jackie Gleason as the uh, Southern Sheriff, you know, boy, you look a lot taller on the radio and uh, making movies that would today make uh, you know, these poor millennials run for their safe spaces. I mean, in a hurry. But God damn, was it funny. So uh, the point of that movie was, uh, you know, these uh, truckers, Smokey was going to run interference for the 18-wheeler. They went to Texas to pick up a big shitload of Coors beer and bring it to a car show party, uh, you know, back uh, in Georgia where they were hired by a couple of big rednecks to do so. And, uh, of course, hilarity ensued. Anyway, 
inside the glove box. Look at all this, extra keys, the original book set. Uh, even, uh, what the hell is this thing? To buckle up shoulder belt stuff, nice. Uh, we do have the original build sheet. I found that underneath the uh, uh, underneath the back seat. And uh, anyway, a bunch of crap comes with this thing documenting its originality, which is incredible. Incredible to find a car uh, that is uh, that is this original. I'm just going to leave that piece of paper down there. This little slide here, good spot for an old revolver. And of course, the Turbo Hydra 350 uh, transmission with the Firebird on the top. Neat stuff. Shifts good again. Yeah, I know. I get it. It's not the performance model with the four-speed. That would be uh, that would be cooler, but uh, it's not. I love the way you can see through the T-tops too. All right, so now we're off and rolling. We're gonna you know go to the car wash or the disco skate park to find some sort of Daisy Duke looking chick and little polyester uh, bottoms and oh man. I mean, does this bring back memories? Holy shit. All right, so let's go into it real quick. Uh, the power sucks, obviously, 185. I mean, it's not terrible. It's probably a quarter mile in the 16s. Um, the uh, the brakes, they're going to pretty much suck. They're non-ABS, uh, but, uh, you know, they're fine. You got discs up front, drums in the back. The WS6 had four-wheel discs. I don't believe we've got a limited slip in this one. In fact, I think it's the 241 rear end, which is uh, made for gas mileage. The steering's pretty responsive. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. Um, you know, here it is. So I've got my shaker hood. Look at that. Look at that. Moving when I jab it. Uh, I've got uh, this big, long sort of... Uh, what is built on a Nova platform, but it's a good riding platform unless you're going over bumps of any kind. Then it'll jar your spine loose. But there's just nothing like this. I mean, you're sitting low, you're, you get this big ridiculous hood in front of you with this crazy shaker thing in the middle of it. Uh, you got your gold chains on, you got your shirt unbuttoned, you got all kinds of chest hair coming out everywhere, and you are one bad mofo heading to the bars or, you know, wherever you're going to go to, um, to have some fun. Uh, it's a car that was immortalized in the movies. You had McHugh, uh, you had Chips, you had, of course, uh, Smokey and the Bandit. And uh, it's just, you know, everyone's going to look over and know it's a Trans Am and give you the thumbs up. Oh, I like this thing. I really, really do. I should be buying it, but you got to draw the line somewhere. Anyway, 1979 Trans Am uh, by Pontiac, of course, a Firebird. Uh, 27,000 original miles. It is true on this car. Not a garage queen, but incredibly original uh, everywhere you look and in uh, pretty great shape all around. Uh, if you have an interest, give us a call, 239-298-8000, on the web at aenaples.com. Thank you so much for having a look. We appreciate it, and we'll, uh, we'll see you with the next one. Take care.